Hey y'all, Ryan Sprague here. As you all know, the Somewhere in the Skies podcast is always free to consume, but it isn't free to create. That's why I've started the Somewhere in the Skies Patreon campaign. On a monthly basis, you give what you think the show is worth. You'll be helping the show continue, grow, and to be something truly communal. And remember, there are rewards for each level of contribution, and the list is only growing. So please, help Somewhere in the Skies now by becoming a patron. To contribute and to learn more, visit www.patreon.com backslash somewhere skies. Thank you for your support. And now, on with the show. This is Somewhere in the Skies with Ryan Sprague. Andrew, thank you so much for joining me today on Somewhere in the Skies. It is my absolute pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me. My pleasure. The uh, The main reason I'm having you here, man, is I'm so bummed I'm not going to be able to make it this year to the Congress. This has been a huge, huge part of my life for a while now, and I have you to thank for that, for getting me involved. And uh, I'm just so excited to see that it's still continuing on and that you and Karen are sort of at the helm now. This is your baby, as it were. So um, this is September 4th through the 8th in downtown Phoenix, the 2019 International UFO Congress. How are you feeling, man? The countdown is on. I know. This is the, the you know, down in the trenches for us. I mean, uh, from here on out, it's crazy because, first of all, setting up is, is crazy. There's so much to do. Right now, I'm printing DVDs. You know, luckily we have some friends coming over where we've uh, we've going to be stuffing the DVD covers. And uh, um, there's just so much. Right now, our house is full of boxes because, you know, <laughs> we have to order all the stuff that we'll be taking over there. So it's just frantic. Busy, busy, busy doing this and that. Um, you know, right now, which is kind of exciting, but it also nerve-wracking. I'm putting together the awards, the films, you know, because mm. what we'll do is – we give away research of the year and, uh, of course, controversial one a couple years ago with Tom DeLong. That's mm-hmm. probably our most famous one. And then uh, we do uh, Lifetime Achievement Awards. So those are kind of nerve wracking because they are, you know, you want to do a really good job with them. I'm not like a video guy. We used to have Michael Klein and, and Tom Ruffin at Open Minds who are, you know, career video people. And so... Uh, I, I know I can, I think, write something pretty decent, but that's even nerve wracking because you don't want to leave out anything good. So yeah. so everything is, you know, all the details get kind of nerve wracking. So it, it's it's crazy right now. Um, it'll be crazy until the whole thing's over. And uh, and so, yeah, yeah, I'm living sure. in a world of crazy. I, I can only imagine. Well, and a lot of people <laughs> don't realize what goes into these things. I mean, yeah. this is like this has broken the world record for being the largest UFO conference in North America so many times. So, I mean, we're not talking <laughs> we're not talking like a dozen people showing up to a stuffy little room. I mean, thousands yeah. of people make it through this thing every year. I'm always astounded when I yeah. I I've spoken once at the event and I can tell you, man, I was I, I've been acting my whole life. I've traveled the country uh, performing for for audiences, and I have never been as nervous as I was when I spoke at the You're International kidding. UFO Congress. Well, A, I mean, it's my people, you know? It's the UFO yeah. people. So they... This isn't like you're speaking to someone who's never heard this stuff before. These people yeah. know their stuff. So I, I remember being backstage and just like, you know, clammy hands and I'm sweating and they're trying to put a microphone on me. And I'm just like, it, plus it was the first time I'd ever spoken about UFOs in public. Uh-huh. So you gave me my start, man. And it's it's no easy task. So um, I, I, I think the the biggest thing that in sets this apart from the other congresses is uh this is now taking place in a completely different location than before so how did you guys what made you decide to move it to downtown phoenix this is awesome 
Well, that's what's funny about this. You know, I we've really kind of we outgrew the last location and it was gorgeous. It was beautiful. Uh, You know, we were fortunate to get an incredible deal. But when we got that deal, it was in the middle of the recession. Mm. And uh, now things are looking much better. So prices have gone up. And out here, that is prime time. You know, February, March, when the weather is amazing out here in Phoenix and it's snowy and rainy and awful everywhere else, everybody wants to come here for their events. And so it's prime location. So we had to leave because it wasn't big enough and because prices were going up so much. Mm. So uh, I've always been of the mind personally that Vegas is the place to go because we just couldn't. There wasn't a venue really that fit here in uh, Phoenix. But there were so many people when I told them that uh, that were like, no, keep it in Arizona. And there was so much of an outcry to keep it here that Karen, who is now the new owner, decided that uh, to listen to them and try to keep it here. And so we were fortunate enough that uh, we were able to, the best location we were able to find was with uh, the Sheraton downtown, which is in the heart of Phoenix, you know, right across from the convention center. Oh, wow. And it kind of was like our dream because we've always thought, you know, it'd be cool to make, you know, like a UFO Comic-Con type of thing that we we get really big. So, uh, that was the idea. So it's, it's cool that, you know, and I think the media is going to pay more attention cause it's in the heart, it's in their space and, uh, uh, it's right where they do business. So they just have to walk down the street, you know, to come interview us and everything. So we're hoping to get more media. In fact, we've heard from a lot of the media who, uh, of course we like them to do something early on, but they're kind of waiting to, to get closer to the event, but we might be on uh, a local show this this weekend um so yeah so that's kind of how it all came about really pricing and availability and and this hotel allows for scalability and uh and the prices are pretty decent that's awesome i mean there's no better feeling than to know like you're kind of outgrowing something in a way you know there's more demand and i mean ufos are bigger now than they've been in a really long time. And we'll get to that because a lot of the people involved with making that happen, making this huge cultural shift in the past few years, uh, are going to be speaking at your event too. And right. Two of those that really stick out to me right now are uh, synonymous with with Area 51. And that's, of course, George Knapp, the guy who helped break the original story and kind of the guy breaking the story for a new generation, uh, Jeremy Corbell in his documentary film. Uh, Bob Lazar. So what are these two guys going to be doing at your event? I was really excited to see that they're both going to be there. You know, I think that the way you framed that was so good that Jeremy is kind of breaking Area 51 to a new generation, and he really is. So uh, George is going to be doing what George does and what's really excited most of us lately, which is he's going to be breaking – a tip news about the Pentagon UFO program. And he has been the number one source really for breaking news m- way more so than even to the stars when it comes to uh, a tip. And why do I say to the stars? You, your listeners are probably aware that, oh, you know, yeah. the guy who ran a tip is now working for to the stars. But Lou Elizondo is, is careful about what he, he presents and he can't share information or he's not willing to share information that isn't his to share. But luckily, George Knapp has been doing the digging. He's got great connections. He's close with Harry Reid. And he's been able to get some of these documents and information out that that Lou has been reticent to get out himself. And so that's great because once it happens, then uh, Lou is able to talk about it because, you know, the information's out in the public. So George uh, is going to be talking about ATIP and uh, giving us more news and information, uh, I believe. And he says he has something new and good to give us. So that'll be really exciting. And, uh, you know, George Knapp, there's, it's funny because uh, you've seen it out there. There's a lot of uh, negativity towards uh, To The Stars. And that has bled over to many of the people reporting on this, including right. myself and others. And George, which is kind of... George has kind of been untouchable there. You you don't get a lot of criticism because there shouldn't be because he's excellent at what he does. He's got a a ton of awards. Um, And it's kind of a funny situation right now where people are kind of blaming him of of being driven by to the stars and kind of 
somehow supporting them when really he's doing his job and he's breaking uh, news related to UFOs and the credibil- credible kind of arena they've gotten in. So uh, it's going to be interesting to hear what he has to say because I think he's going to reference some of the um, critics that have been online to to speak to what he sees and I see as kind of silly arguments, kind of uh, really the trying to defame anybody associated for reasons unknown. I can't even understand it. Well, what we're doing is just you know revealing the facts, and that's all that G- that George is doing, and what he's revealing is groundbreaking. So what he's doing is great. So it'll be kind of fun to hear him. Uh, kind of uh, uh, hear his opinion about some of the <laughs> the noisy negatives, as, as Stanton Friedman would say. Oh, yeah. God rest and then his soul. <laughs> Jeremy has got a cool talk. He's calling Clockwork Orange. UFOs are Clockwork Orange is what he calls it. And uh, this is going to be kind of interesting, I think. He essentially says... Um, He's going to look into the more exotic events and ideas around artificial intelligence. And I think he's kind of going to go into maybe, you know, some of these aliens or or UFOs are, you know, the result of artificial intelligence. So that's kind of interesting. But in relation to Area 51, like you mentioned before, he's also going to bring us um, some late breaking information as far as the storm Area 51. So he has been uh, it was his documentary that inspired the uh, meme that is so famous out there to storm area 51. And so, uh, you know, people obviously have been coming to him. Hey, you know, this thing's going on. What are we going to do? And his thing is to try to make sure there's a venue at this event that is educational and safe because uh, this is all about education. This is, you know, supposed to be about wanting to know what is at Area 51 and the and information about UFOs. Plus, it's in the desert. You know, there's no services around. So he wants to make sure that everyone is safe and taken care of. So that's been his focus. And so he's been uh, just recently, you know, it was announced he's working with the Alien Research Center. Um, and uh, so he's going to be talking about that. And interesting enough, you know, if you go to the, the website for Rachel, Nevada, the city, the city says, don't come here to Rachel. <laughs> These people who are coming here are not invited. Our residents are going to have their guns ready to protect their property. They don't want you here. But go to the Alien Research Center. They've got something going on. Go over there. So even the city of Rachel is uh, supporting the Alien Research Center. So we'll hear more about the plans for the Air- Storm Area 51 from uh, Jeremy as well. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, this thing literally took us all by storm. You know, yeah. to use the pun, this came out of nowhere. And it just shows, like, the power of social media. Yeah. We, within a night, this all happened. And, you know, a lot of people are criticizing those trying to start these uh, this alien stock, as it were. You know, this big festival that they yeah. want to plan or, or whatnot. But, or, like, it's an instant cash grab. But, I mean, let's be honest. If you're living in the middle of the desert somewhere, and there's the possibility of, like, thousands of people showing up to, to throw their money at you to <laughs> get some <laughs> get some information about, you know, UFOs or Area 51. Like, of course they're going to take advantage of that. So, yeah. you know, I've heard a lot of criticism. Oh, this is just another cash grab for those who talk about Bob Lazar or Area 51 or this, that. But, you know, you and I have both personally spoken to, to people like Jeremy Corbell and others trying to do this stuff. And uh, they are being very careful they they almost feel a responsibility now to to make sure this goes off safely i mean you and i both know there are going to be some idiots who actually try to storm those gates and yeah. i think they're going to be not surprised but they're going to be very uh there it's a rude awakening trust me I, I was out there not too long ago and you do not want to mess with those people and not just the guards at the base but like you said the the locals in Rachel <laughs> yeah. like these aren't your everyday people who are just going to say uh you know please don't come out here they they will shoot you <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's what's funny i think that the the uh, law enforcement's going to have a strong presence they've said in the news recently i think it was george knapp who even pr- was writing about that this week 
But uh, I think that they will have a strong presence and and that will be alone a major deterrent. It's one thing to pass those gates when there's nobody there or there's a truck, you know, uh, half a mile away up on a hill. It's another thing when there's a line of of guys with with weapons, you know, right there at the gate. Um, So I think that that will be a large deterrent. And I do appreciate the idea of, hey, let's not storm the gates. Let's party. Yeah. Uh, and there certainly are opportunists, uh, for better or worse, who are looking to make money. But what's great is, is Jeremy's focus, which has been to educate and to make sure that people are safe. And, and I'm glad that he's had that focus. And he's probably had an influence in making sure uh, there are safe places for people. But beyond that, in the end, if this becomes like a Coachella, you know, of Area 51, where it's a big Area 51 festival, that's not necessarily bad either because it does bring awareness to um, and, you know, it it makes people realize that there are a lot of people interested in the information about what might be out there, uh, what is out there and what is what is being hidden from us when it comes to this topic of UFOs. So um, that would be I think it'd be kind of cool to have this yearly kind of festival thing. Yeah, I'm all for it. I mean, unfortunately, I'm going to be at a, another conference that same weekend. But if this becomes a yearly thing, you can bet I'll be flying out there for this thing every year. Yeah. I'm excited, man. Um, well, you did bring up a tip, and uh, I did want to cover one other gentleman who's going to be at your event who's been heavily uh, looked into this and has broken some exclusives about a tip and that's brian bender how Mm. how did this happen i i was so surprised to see this well you'll notice he's off the list now oh and this is really unfortunate he's not going to be able to do it however um i don't know if he even wanted me to share that this or not but i'm going to so (laughs) that's uh, fine man we can always edit this out if we have to don't worry (laughs) no that's fine (laughs) he's going to be passing by the conference at some point and hanging out there and hopefully even writing a story. And uh, essentially, you know, we've become friends because as we've been, he's gotten attacked as well. So people have been attacking and I am so honored that they're grouping me in, but they've been attacking uh, as a group, George and Brian, who don't even know each other. Uh, Leslie Kane, who I don't think he knows Leslie Kane either. And so um, we started talking, you know, DMing each other a little bit as we were kind of building these attacks. And uh, it turns out he lives nearby. So we ended up eat, meeting for lunch. And now we've become friends. We've had dinner and lunch several times over the last few weeks. So, yeah, so he's been toying with the idea. And I've been telling him, Man, you have not met George. George is awesome. It would be a dream come true if I could, you know, we could all, you, George, and I have this conversation on the stage uh, about, so people could get, like, the differences between them. And uh, and he was all for it, but unfortunately, and he even, you know, said, go ahead and post it, sent us information, but unfortunately isn't going to be able to do it in the end. But I think it would have been, bit important because kind of like what I was talking about earlier, Bender could care less. He really isn't, has no dog in the race, pony in the race when it comes to UFOs. Mm-hmm. He's, it's kind of a, it's an interesting story because there's interesting news about it coming out, especially in Washington, D.C., which is what Politico focuses on. Uh, he's been able to ask some lawmakers uh, in Washington about the topic. And so it makes for interesting stories. And that's what he likes. He doesn't know you know, one way or another what's going on, but there's some interesting information. As for supporting to the stars, he could care less. Of course, he's he's a good guy. He wants everybody to be successful, but he's not, you know, it's up to them to be successful. Uh, It's not up to uh, Brian to help them be successful. Brian's just reporting on the story. So I, I would have loved to have Uh, brought them because their sourcing is very different too. So for instance, when Bender first met the uh, group, essentially Elizondo and Chris Mellon, and they shared some information with him, he then went to vet those, vet these guys. Of course, Chris Mellon doesn't need any vetting because Chris Mellon's amazing uh, and has a huge background and is a very credible and, and, uh, you know, a person who's been in the defense industry for a long time and, and in Washington. But uh, Elizondo, he doesn't know. 
So he went in and, you know, he's been a, uh, a war reporter and writing on defense for years. Mm -hmm. So he's got tons of contacts and he checked with his contacts on the inside. And they said, yeah, this is a real deal. You know, they, Harry Reid wanted this UFO investigation group. And so he put it together and, and it was ran by this Elizondo and everything. So that's how he vetted it. The difference is, of course, George Knapp has been friends with Bigelow, who has been part of this since the beginning, since it was B Bigelow Aerospace that was uh, contracted to work with ATIP. Right. So George has already known about the credibility and that this is all going on. So that's what's interesting. Uh, they come from two totally different perspectives on this. And uh, and the way they've approached the story has been completely different. That their facts are similar, and those facts being that uh, Elizondo's been telling the truth, and so has Harry Reid and all, all of the people related to it as far as the details. That's just, you know, the facts that they've discovered through various sources. Um that, you know, that's the way it is, people. I don't know why people want to freak out and be weird about it. Right. But um, uh, that's what would have been fun to bring them up on the stage, especially when uh, I think that would have been the first time they met. Oh, wow. That, that's such a big platform. That would have been amazing. Well, you yeah, know, anything can happen. Who knows? But um, yeah, I'm sure in the future we'll be able to get him at one of these UFO conferences for sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I hope made, so. He's made some amazing contributions so far, and I know they've really only begun. I mean, you've got Bender, you've got I, Tyler Rogaway doing some amazing things over at the uh, the War Zone, the Drive. Yeah. Um, UFO coverage has never, you know, really been so strong. I think in terms of uh, objective journalism and research and taking the topic seriously. And yes, there are detractors; there always are, but I think. Once we keep moving forward and finding common ground, hopefully everyone can start really uh, working together. Now, I I respect both ends of the spectrum. You know, I've had those who are a little more on the air on the side of extreme skepticism when it comes to, to the stars. I've had them on my show, and I've had those who firmly support everything to the stars is doing. And uh, you know, as someone kind of sitting back and watching it play out while a lot of other extremely diligent researchers and journalists are out there digging. Um, I'm just looking forward to where this all goes. It, it's, it's such an exciting time to be in the UFO field and to see all these things happening. And whether you like them or not, we do have Tom DeLong to thank for that. We truly do. Exactly. You're exactly right. And, uh, you know, this wouldn't have happened without him. And um, and it is happening, which is extraordinary. And uh, and it is funny because it's such important stuff that we've wanted for the UFO field for so long or so many people have wanted out there. And uh, so I think everybody's taken aback a little bit about the negativity. But then if you look at what Bigelow went through, he went through the same thing. He oh, went through yeah. a lot of negativity. In fact, he essentially left dealing with the UFO community because it was there's a it was a lose lose situation. And that may happen again. And if it does happen again, it's no one's fault except for the UFO community itself. And they may get lost in that left in the dust. Uh, and hey. You can either choose to participate or not, and uh, participation means discovery uh, with working with teams and working with others, and it means you know everyone working together to to discover information, uh, as opposed to siloing yourself and, and starting battles and fights that just kind of make us chase our tails. Um, there's real work being done out there, and it's important to focus on that because if you do focus on that. Uh, like you said, it's going to be a wild ride, and there's going to be a lot of great information. Uh, I, kn I know, man, and I am riding that wave as long as possible. Um, well, in terms of the real work being done, uh, another person I was really excited to see that you're having is uh, Chase Kletsky. Now, a lot of people know her from her field investigation work, but a lot of people may not know that she's actually working in D.C. now, lobbying 
about UFOs. I mean, this is so cool. I, I was I was in DC recently and we were going to grab some coffee. We weren't able to do it. But when I heard what she was doing, I was like, finally, finally, there are people out there, people like Stephen Bassett and, and Chase Kletsky really trying to get into the inner, you know, the inner workings of Congress and where I think a lot of this change could really happen. I mean, it's one thing to tell a UFO story or to storm Area 51, but it's another to like really go to the people who make policies about these things or could potentially make policies about these things and uh, convince them that there's something to look at. And I mean, we have representatives now talking in the public about wanting to know more about UFOs. So um, what what is Chase going to be talking about? I'm so excited about this. Yeah, Chase is great. So her title is called the UFO Game Changers. And essentially, she's going to be talking about what we were just talking about. Um, why has this changed? Like you said, why are these wall ma- uh, lawmakers talking about UFOs? Um, why is, uh, are these things changing? And, and who are the people who made these changes uh, happen? And that's what Chase is going to be discussing. So she's kind of vague about it. Um, and I think that's uh, by design. Because she wants to not kind of tip her hat as to what she's going to be discussing in full. But I'm really excited about it. Essentially, because she lives in Washington, D.C. now. She is a registered lobbyist. And she has been speaking with lawmakers herself about uh, UFO development. So she's going to be sharing with us, look, guys, the landscape has changed. Here's why. Here's the people who made this change happen and how they did it. And I think that's going to be fascinating. It is. And I mean, I know one of the people she probably spoke to at some point is uh, Kevin Day, someone that I've recently been in touch with, too, um, in terms of his involvement with the the Nimitz incident. And, um, you know, Kevin's been seen on a couple TV shows now at this point, um, maybe a conference or two. But I'm so excited to see that he's actually going to be giving like a full length presentation, uh, a Q and A as well at your event. So this is great. Um, what do you make of Kevin? I know you've had him on your show in the past. Kevin is awesome. Kevin is one of the coolest people. He's a really nice guy. He's intelligent. Uh, he's patient. Um, you know, and he's just a really good person. He's a really neat guy. So I'm very excited about it. Uh, you know. Um, he has created a little controversy in saying that he has had some emotional effects due to uh, his involvement with all of this. He being a radar operator, essentially the guy who, you know, for like a really, he's the one who vectored in. He's the one who said, OK, you know, Fravor, you got to come in and, and, you know, vector as far as telling beginning the the vectoring in or showing them where to go mm-hmm. to you know see these objects and uh and he saw them over a period of time so he'll be sharing you know what he experienced and i think that it's important for people to hear you know what kind of effects he's have the the sort of thing he talks about is that it's his job to make sure that airspace is safe for our guys uh at all times and when there's something invading that airspace and you don't know what it is and you can't do anything about it, that especially at the end of your career, like it was for Kevin when he um, he was, you know, p- retiring, uh, you know, that can affect you. And it did affect him uh, greatly. And, uh, you know, Sean Cahill, who was another witness who lives in San Diego, uh, I've recently talked to him and he's talked about this, too, about how. You know, he's talked to a lot of military guys where these UFO encounters really has a great effect on them. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's kind of a thing. And I could get it. Um, So uh, that's what's great about Kevin. He's a very thoughtful, uh, open person. He's, uh, you know, kind of uh, (laughs) how he's out of the military. I don't know how he was in that. But he's faced his emotions to understand what's going on there. And uh, he's recognized that, uh, you know, this has had an effect on him. So I think that's kind of an important part of his message besides, you know, obviously the incredible uh, encounters that he was involved with. Right. And I mean, when we first got these videos, the gimbal, the, uh, the, the Tic Tac, all the go fast, even, uh, you know, it's nothing but just a video and it's cool to look at and everything. But then when you start to attach the testimony 
of those who actually witnessed it. That's a whole other piece of the puzzle. And then when you get to know the witness, I mean, it's just, it's like an onion. There's just so many layers to these UFO mysteries. And once you get to the actual witness of an event, that's when you can really get to the core of, okay, how did it affect them? What do they think it was other than what the public or some government agency says it was? And uh, let's, let's hear what they have to say. Let's give these people voices. So I'm so happy that, you know, the tick tac ufo that's become such a big thing um in the mainstream media and in the ufo field uh that we finally have stories to tell to that event people like sean and kevin and and even fravor i mean and the female witness as well we're now hearing how these events affected them and so that sometimes says more than just uh you know a 30 second video ever could Right. And Kevin's a great witness. I mean, we all love to hear from jet fighter pilots, and that's exciting. And I was in Oregon to hear from David Fravor, and that was exciting. But really, a jet fighter pilot only has a small piece of the puzzle. What's great about Kevin being a radar operator is he's looking at the whole area that they're, op- uh, you know, area of operation that they're working in. So he has an overall view of what occurred throughout the area and throughout the entire time period. So he's, you know, the eye in the sky, literally, you know, looking over things. And he was a radar supervisor. And that's another aspect that makes him important is that he can tell us, you know, from a very high level what occurred, which uh, he's going to have more information than most of the witnesses involved. Mm, yeah, that's awesome. I can't wait to uh, hopefully get the DVD of that one. I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> they've been seen all over our planet, somewhere in the skies. I'm talking about flying saucers. Hey guys, Ryan Sprague here, and I'm excited to tell you about Saucer, your source for original and authentic ufology-inspired essentials and apparel, symbolizing self-enrichment. Elevate your craft at thesaucerbrand.com. Use promo code SKIES for 20% off your entire purchase. I've got their bomber jacket, their t-shirts, and their crew neck sweater. And I am rocking them like crazy here in New York City. People are starting to ask me about it, and they're even starting to look up into the skies. Saucer products are sustainably made in the USA, with only the most comfortable fabrics known to man. Receive 20% off your entire purchase now when you use the code SKIES at thesaucerbrand.com. Show everyone that you believe and get your saucer gear now. That's thesaucerbrand.com. Keep looking somewhere in the skies and remember to elevate your craft. Well, another big part of mainstream ufology, I would say, in the past couple of years is Project Blue Book, um, a TV show that you've covered extensively over at Den of Geek. And, um, you know, Paul Hynek was recently at the UFO Symposium. Um, I was able to get a little bit of audio of him talking, but this is going to be a full presentation of Paul talking all about his father's work and everything. So this is cool, man. Um, Are you excited for this one? I'm very excited for this one. I've I've spoken, I've had him on the podcast, but I'm excited to talk to him again and uh, in public and uh, for a couple of reasons, mainly because Project Blue Book, he's a perfect representative for the show because a lot of ufologists criticize that the show is not accurate and it is terribly inaccurate. It, <laughs> it they're is. right. It's very <laughs> inaccurate. It's completely fictionalized. His mom did not have an illicit affair with a Russian agent, you know. <laughs> None of that sort of thing happened. But he's also works in the movie and entertainment industry. So he gets that they're going to sex it up. And it is, you know, it, and it does admit that it's only loosely based on this. You know, it's, it's a fictionalized version of events. So it's great to have his perspective to say, OK, this is not how it really happened. This is what it was really like to live in the Heineck household. However, working on the show um, here's how I feel about how they fictionalize things. And mostly he's pretty cool with it. So I, I really want to kind of uh, put him to task on a couple of the more wild kind of uh, arcs in the series. But in the end, the series getting a second season. Uh, you know, I was there at Comic-Con for the panel and it was a huge response. The room was packed. 
people were really excited. And so I think this show has been received very, very well and people are liking it. And I feel that it does bring awareness to Heineck. And, you know, we criticize this is one of the it's kind of getting back to the A-tip issue is in the UFO community. We, we we're so, you know, insulated from the rest of the world in a way and not watching. And I think it's important to take a step back. This is how UFOs become mainstream. This is really how disclosure happens. The community, the, the society gets comfortable with the topic and does what it does with any topic that is popular. It takes it and packages it and sells it and sexes it up and it attacks it from every different angle. The good thing is, is that a ton of information is getting out there and a lot of interest is being generated. And, you know, down the line, there will be that uh, more historical fiction version of Heineck, you know, that is more historically accurate. I even hear there are projects out there that are working on this currently. And, uh, you know, we probably wouldn't have gotten that. We wouldn't get all this interest. What, you know, I included, and I was so lucky at AlienCon before the first time I met Paul Heineck, uh, it was before the show had aired. Heineck was actually in one of my lectures. I didn't even know this. Mm. And I always include, I try to include uh, J. Allen Heineck as much as possible in my lectures. And sure enough, this was the one where I talked about him a lot again. And I always say nice things because I don't want people to forget this important figure in history. And I've feared that people were, he was getting, his whole story was getting lost to obscurity. And, uh, and that was my biggest fear. So it was great to hear Paul Heineck, you know, he was like, thank you for saying so much great things about my dad and so on forth. Uh, and, and the show, it's great to see it popular because it does bring his, his memory, his, uh, you know, into the public eye again. And I think that's really important. So there is some silver lining. There is a lot of positive that comes out of this stuff, even if, you know, certainly it can be criticized for some uh, major embellishments, yeah. putting it lightly. Well, in, in you know, we, we've said this in the past over at Rogue Planet, too. Like, this show is not a documentary. It is a fictional television show. So take that for what it is and extrapolate the, the fact from the fiction and watch these cool things they do after the episodes where they tell you about the actual case. Right. I think that's so responsible and the of the articles. History Channel to do. And the articles. My God, I can't tell you how many times... I've been doing research in the past year, and my number one, you know, website that I'm always tripping upon is the History Channel. Yeah, their they articles so are great. Good, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exciting. I'm I'm glad that you know they understand what they're doing could be, um, you know, misconstrued as fact, especially when you know it's based on actual events. But but to then go that extra step and be responsible and do that, I, th I think it's great. So. I, I'm excited to see what they come up with season two. I know we're going to be touching on Roswell and possibly a, a few other, you know, seminal cases in the UFO field. So I'm, I'm interested to see how they cover Roswell, you know, yeah, <laughs> especially with uh, the past history with you and I with Roswell. I, I'm excited yeah. to see what happens. Um, well, you've got a bunch of uh, also really interesting experiencers coming. You know, you've got Debbie Jordan from the, um, you know, that the book Intruders was based on. You've got Terry Lovelace, who has one of the craziest string of event UFO stories I've ever heard. Um, and I don't mean crazy in a bad way. I just mean, like, wow, <laughs> yeah, this guy's been through everything. And uh, the other really big one that caught my attention was Calvin Parker from the Pascagoula UFO incident. How how did you get this guy, man? I know he doesn't do these things often. Well, you know, I was contacted like a year ago from Philip Mantle, and he said, oh, my gosh, you know. And, well, actually, I was contacted a couple years ago from Philip, and he was like, I, I want to reprint the Pascagoula, the, the Wendell Stevens Pascagoula book. And uh, Open Mind, uh, my boss, John Rayo, had purchased Wendell Stevens uh, archives, and Wendell Stevens wrote that book or published it. And uh, so John said, sure. And then but I had told him you, you probably ought to get permission from um, from Wendell's daughter, because I know she feels like she has a uh, claim to some of that as well. And uh, it'd probably be a good idea. I helped him contact her and she gave the OK. So he, he started working on it. Well, in the process, he was having a hard time of getting a hold of Carlin Parker because he wanted to. And he finally did. And when he did, he told Calvin, Let, let's write the book a new book from your perspective. Um, and, 
so you could get your word out there. And, and he talked Calvin into it. Philip's a great guy, so it's not surprising. And Calvin Parker's a really great guy, really nice guy. And so they worked together. And Cal- and Philip told me I, I that he convinced Calvin to promote the book for a year. And that uh, the big thing they wanted to do was come speak at the UFO Congress. So Calvin was like one of our first speakers we had signed up. And he said he wants to speak at the Congress, and then he's retiring. He's not talking UFOs. He's done. And I said, okay, uh, you know, that sounds great. We're privileged to have him. And what's funny is then he's speaking all over the place. So Phil <laughs> got him everywhere. So he's been every uh, to a lot of different places. And finally, we're going to be doing uh, the Congress. And he says, you know, uh, after the Congress, he's do- going back to just straight fishing. Because yeah. that's what he likes to do. Yeah. And uh, usually he's already fishing. He's probably fishing right now. But sometimes his fishing has to get interrupted by doing uh, television interviews or documentary interviews or going to uh, an event like this. And so uh, I think he's happy that this to him will be it. We'll see if that comes out to be the case because his story is becoming very popular. Yeah. It's getting a lot of attention uh, and, uh, so we'll see what happens, but yeah, he's a great guy. I've interviewed him before. I've loved interviewing him. I'm very excited to get people to meet him in person, uh, to help share the story with our audience and then to hear what kind of questions that, uh, the audience has for him and, uh, what sort of information that reveals. Yeah. It's one of the big ones, you know, you hear, you hear about it all the time, uh, all over the place. So I, I'm excited that we finally, we still have someone to tell this story, to preserve yeah. it. You know, we unfortunately lost the other gentleman that was involved with it. So we mm. kind of have his story to rely on at this point. But you know what? If he's going to get interrupted to do, uh, you know, from fishing, if he's going to get interrupted to do conferences, I guess that's better than getting interrupted by another yeah. flying saucer. <laughs> right, exactly. He didn't like those guys very much. Yeah. Oh, and it's fishing. He doesn't go fishing. He does fishing. Fishing. Gone fishing. There you go. Gone fishing. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, let's see. Um, you've got Michael P. Masters talking about um, us from the future. Really interesting concept of could aliens be us from the future? We've heard a lot of people propose these theories. So I'm really mm-hmm. interested to hear him talk about that. Have you interviewed him? Not yet. I've been trying to get him on the show for a while now, but he's a okay. hard guy to get. Um, yeah. I but but the interviews I have heard him give, he's extremely articulate, and he has a lot of science and anthropology to sort of back up what he's saying. Right. He's not just out there spouting this theory with no you know evidence or or ways to really back it up. So. I, I've always been really fascinated by the prospect of aliens being us from the future. Um, I it, agree. it actually makes a lot more sense than I think a lot of the other theories out there. So to know that someone's me, focusing just on that, I love it. I know. To me, it's just as legit a theory or a possibility as an extraterrestrial civilization. Totally. Um, you know, it is just as legit. And for some reason, we don't focus on this or you don't hear much about it. And I think that um, that's what I really love about this. Like you said, he's, he's knowledgeable. He's a professor of biological anthropology. So I have not heard an interview yet. I've been kind of saving myself. And uh, so I'm very, very I've heard nothing but good things. Uh, I'm very excited for his talk. Me too. And again, if you can ever ever have that doctor in front of your name and be speaking at a UFO yeah. conference, it only boosts our credibility tenfold. Right. So <laughs> I love it. Uh, let's see. You've got the power couple, the Dolans, um, <laughs> coming. So I'm sure Dolan will surprise us with something new. Uh, Who Tracy. got engaged at yeah. the UFO Congress two years ago. Was that two years ago now? Wow. Yeah. Time flies. It does. I think that's the one you spoke at, wasn't it? Yep. 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 Yes, it was. I remember. I remember seeing the photo. I, I wasn't there when he uh, popped the question, but I was definitely there to see the ring afterwards. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, Tracy's going to be talking about remote viewing, so that's really interesting. I had no idea she was into all that stuff. Yeah, neither did I. Uh, you know, uh, I think it was Karen who proposed, you know, we should see have Tracy talk. And I was like, I didn't know she was doing talks. And Karen, you know, had done some research and said, yeah, she's she has done remote viewing and and I guess that's a big deal for her and uh 
And I was like, heck yeah, that would be awesome. Because Tracy, if you've met her, is just incredible. She is Absolutely. just always smiling. In fact, the picture that we have on the website, she's kind of got a little bit of a smile. And that's the least smile I've ever seen on her. Because <laughs> she's always got a big old smile. She's always very friendly. Uh, and she's just a lot of fun to be around. And uh, so uh, that's exciting that I think people are going to, you know, love her and uh, no matter what, let alone if she shares some really great information, which I think she will, because if you read uh, the bio and you read her background, she's done a lot of work in this area. And uh, I'm really excited for it. Me too. I mean, you've got some of our favorites. You've got David Hatcher Childress, Christopher O'Brien. Um, some other new faces, uh, Mark D'Antonio, one of our other vets, uh, Chuck Zukowski talking about Alien Highway. Love that show. I can't wait to <laughs> hear the, uh, hear the background on all that. Um, but one of the really interesting things that I came across, um, being, a uh, you know, a script writer, uh, myself is this film panel with Keith Aram and Dean Alioto um, and James Fox is going to be there too. You've got all these amazing filmmakers in the UFO field coming to the Congress this year. So what are all those guys going to be up to? Well, this is going to be a lot of fun. And this was, well, Dean and Keith are working on a project and they're going to be filming some people. Uh, in fact, if you're coming to the Congress and you had your own experience, they would love to talk to you. So they're interviewing people who have had experiences. <laughs> And they're challenging the kind of idea that everyone who um, kind of like Jason McClellan's book, that everyone who has a sighting is, uh, you know, kind of a goofy, um, you know, uh, weirdo. <laughs> yeah, tinfoil hat person. So that's the project they're working on, which is really fun. But they want to talk about their experience making fiction and nonfiction movies about UFOs, their inspiration and what it's been like. And some of the difficulties when they do run across some of the, for lack of a better term, uh, tinfoil hat people. I mean, the type of, uh, you know, conspiracy theories and, you know, BS that gets in the way. So, for instance, you know, Dean Aliotto spoke a couple of years or last year and he talked about how this movie he made. People will not believe him that, you know, this movie he made was not real. It was fake. He, it <laughs> right. was fictionalized. And there's a lot of people in this field that don't believe him or that we're trying to convince people. And there's new videos out there all the time trying to convince people that it is real. And uh, I think that's important because it shows that um, there are a lot of people who just don't want real information. I think they just want um, kind of make believe uh, it, but uh, which is their business, of course. So just kind of the weirdness, how weird it is and uh, to be working in this field and uh, kind of the difficulties they run run across, but also some of the major um, benefits, some of the things that, you know, because uh, they love bringing information about UFOs and trying to promote them as a, a legitimate, you know, area of research. And so uh, that's so it's all of this stuff. And of course, James Fox is going to be doing a lecture where he's going to be sharing for the first time, finally, some information about this much, much uh, eagerly awaited documentary he's been working on for the last couple of years with, like you said earlier, Lee Spiegel. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's really exciting. We're going to hear from him and then hear his thoughts. And these guys are all really witty, fun people. So it's probably going to be a lot of fun. And then Paul Hynek is actually joining us because people don't know. He's actually got a whole background and working on lots of movies and games. Um, So he's he's worked in Hollywood. So uh, and having, you know, also, like we talked about earlier, spanning this truth versus fiction kind of arena when it comes to UFOs, you know, he'll be sharing his perspectives and thoughts, too. So it's going to be fun. Awesome. Yeah, there's, you know, if those are the the people sort of spearheading UFO coverage in in film, uh, I, I think we're in good hands for sure. And I for can't sure. wait to finally, finally see some footage from this James Fox thing. We've been waiting years for this. Yes. <laughs> but I know it'll be worth it. I, I have absolutely no doubt in my mind. Um Well, sort of moving away from the speakers, Alejandro, um, you have another interesting thing that's new to the Congress this year, and that's these workshops. Um, Can you tell us a little about what this is and who's going to be involved with this? 
Yeah, well, there's always, of course, uh, we've got more speakers this year than ever. And because that's usually what people want. They want to hear from more and more people. And so, you know, lunch is a perfect time to provide more time to, to hear from some more people. So um, during the lunch, there are uh, workshops that people can go to. They do cost extra, but lunch will be provided, uh, of course, so that you can have your lunch and still see all of the lectures of the day. Uh, most of these uh, workshop people are also doing our experiencer sessions, or some of them are, so that'll be good too. So for instance, Rebecca Hardcastle Wright, who uh, is a local and, and she's, uh, you know, talks about uh, ET experiences essentially. Uh, and of course, Kathleen Martin is always at the conference. She heads up the uh, up experience or research group for the for move on mm -hmm. and then some others david hatcher childress people just love him so you get to have some more one-on-one -on -one time with him travis walton uh we really weren't able to fit him onto the schedule uh he's got a lot going on but uh he's going to be there for a while for a few days and uh, we were able to get a uh, lunch workshop with him people love to hear from him so you'll get more with him Richard Dolan uh, wants to talk more about crash retrieval with people. And then Carolyn Corey, who, uh, you know, won an EBE Film Festival Award, and she's been around discussing uh, ET contacts as well. So it provides a much more intimate um, uh, setting where there's just you, a few other people, and that uh, researcher. So you can spend a lot more time getting to know them, asking your questions, and learning more. So uh, that's what the workshops are about. I love that. Yeah. And I think another big thing about the Congress in general that uh, that people should really understand is that you you get to see everyone speak at this event. It's, it's not like these other con, you know, conventions where you have to pick and you you will not see everyone, you know, as much as right. I love Alien Con. Like, there's 10 other things going on while you're speaking. So I was never able to go see friends talk or go to panels because I was either involved with something or people told me, oh, I wanted to come to your talk, but there was this panel at this time, so and so on. So that's why I like that the Congress is, you know, stretched out throughout at least three days and you get to see everything you went and paid for. Exactly. You know, when you're coming to an event, you know, you want to see the people who are there at the event. And even if you don't know the people, I want you to see them because they have something great to say that you might not be aware of. And so I want you to see them. And, uh, you know, luckily we've gotten the reputation of, you know, of having great speakers that even people that people don't know turn out to be great speakers so for instance one of them i'm excited about is tui snyder she's a travel writer but she wrote a book about uh or she's working on a book and she did does this lecture on the great texas airship mystery of 1897 oh and cool. in, yeah a great case you know a great flap of ufo she's got all of these news clippings so i know people are gonna love that talk uh, whereas, you know, if you had to choose between her and David Hatcher Childress, people might all go to Childress and then people wouldn't find out about this new and great information that she has. Mm -hmm. So exactly like you said, this makes them go in and say, OK, well, let's hear what she has to say. And, you know, there's so many times like your talk, you know, where people come out of it and they're like, I didn't know what to expect. But I'm I'm so glad that you had, you know, this person because it, it was amazing. It was great. And um that's what's really fun about the conference, not just having the, the the people who are always out there kind of sharing their new stuff, but also having these new people who people have never heard of sharing information and you people getting to be able to get in there. So it's it's twofold. You get to if you want to see Childress, you're going to see Childress if you buy a ticket. But you're also going to have an opportunity to see some other great talks as opposed to having to choose between a few and then missing out on something that could have been incredible for you. So, yeah, I think this is really important that everybody gets in, you know, because like you said, I love Alien Con too. It's fun. We get to do a lot of talks. But then, like, you know, I'll, I'll do a different talk every time, three or four different talks. And it's kind of a bummer because if I'm doing a talk next to a big event going on, 
my favorite talk might get very few people, whereas a talk that I'm not as excited about or I've done a million times might get a packed room. And it's like, well, that's great, but it would have been more fun if I could have presented this new stuff to more okay. people. That's so, a good point. yeah. Yeah, I remember my first Alien Con, my my solo presentation. I was up against X Files twenty five years later with David Duchovny. So like, oh my come gosh. on, you know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> that's a little hard. Ryan to versus against. David Duchovny. Although you got like the the one picture that was that's memed true. essentially from the whole conference you know, with uh, Giorgio and and. That David. is so true, man. If only I had copyrighted that photo, I would be <laughs> a millionaire right now. Yeah. <laughs> but that's the way the cookie crumbles. I'm glad yeah. that the public now has that meme forever. Yes. Um, it, it was a momentous occasion to say the it least. It was. <laughs> um, well, okay. So sort of the the last thing involved with the Congress that everyone really likes is the film festival. So mm. what do we got this year? I, I've I've heard from some young up-and-coming filmmakers that they're having their films there so um yeah i'm excited to hear about this again being a, a film buff myself the film festival this year might be dare i say the best year i mean the lineup we have is absolutely incredible uh all of the films and maybe it's just the technology getting better or we're getting out there about the EBE Film Festival. We're getting a lot of submissions from California and, you know, from professional filmmakers. But just some really good stuff. So Jack and John, J3, uh, Jack Roth and John Semple and uh, Jamie Cernoff are, are J3. Along with people such as Chase Kletsky and Lori Wagner, some other friends of ours, put together this film, Extraordinary, The Seating. And that... Uh, it is a very strong contender. So this is a great film. It's won already a bunch of awards at film festivals. Um, we have one from a French gentleman. He submitted a film last year. It's called South Shore Origins. The special effects on this movie are some of the best special effects I've ever seen for any movie. Totally contend with Hollywood. It is mostly fiction, this one. It's not documentary like the majority, but it's really good. Of course, Jeremy Corbell has had a couple blockbusters this year. Bob Lazar, Area 51, and Flying Saucers, and Hunt for the Skinwalker, both of which will be in the film festival. And another very, very strong contender is Tim Crawford, who owns UFO TV. He has submitted two films. He's kind of doing like the other uh, content providers and starting to produce his own content. And uh, it's, it's, it's really good stuff. I mean, high quality and uh, he's got two, one called The Cosmic Matrix, which he put together with Ted Peters, and then one called Space Geist. And uh, they're all solid, solid films. I have no idea who's going to win. I'm just, uh, I'm so excited at, at, about who might win. And then for the shorts, we have a ton of shorts. Jeremy submitted three. <laughs> two of them are kind of seen. Bob Lazar that have been seen before. Another one is Skinwalker, George Knapp Tells All, where it's kind of George Knapp unplugged on Skinwalker. Um, and then there's a few others, a couple that are fiction. Uh, Peter Robbins and Jennifer Stein with Bob Terrio put together one on James Forrestal. And, uh, and these others from people in Hollywood, one called The Awakening, one called Rift, one called Alien Guy Tim, are fun fictional. But they're really neat. For example, Alien Guy Tim is this guy who's an engineer who's an abductee. And at first he's kind of talking to the camera like a like a 90 day fiance or something mm -hmm, like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it's kind of funny. And you're like, this guy's weird and quirky. But uh, but then there's some great then it moves into the scene where it's interviewing his brother and sister who are skeptical. And they're kind of like your your regular family member. Like, what the heck is this? I don't know what he's talking about. Or why he's saying this stuff. And then they have them all together and they argue. And it just feels like a real conversation. You know, these real conversations that go on between people who are interested in this field who are who have believed they've experienced something and their family members who are skeptical. They still love them and they uh, support them but are skeptical that they, they really had this experience. So I think it's great. That's an example of kind of the intriguing novel ways that people outside of kind of the UFO community who are educated on what goes on in it, um, putting together films 
that uh, take a different look at the topic. And uh, so I think it's going to be 12 hours of film viewing on Tuesday, September 3rd for the judges. 12 hours of films. But they're really good films. Judging is free. If you come to the Sheraton Grand uh, downtown in in Phoenix uh, at 9 a.m. on Tuesday the 3rd, you can come in, and as long as you're going to watch all of the films in one category, you can be a judge. Uh, you just got to see all the films. So, you know, if you're a film lover, come. And there's a lot of people who do. There's people who fly in early and locals who look forward to this every year. And uh, I know 12 hours sounds like a lot, but this is 12 hours of really good film. So I think that they're going to be fine. Sometimes the films aren't that great. And they're like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe I sat through that. <laughs> but in this case, I think they're going to really enjoy all of them. That's awesome. And I mean, I that was probably my favorite part of the Congress when I volunteered. I, I used to help co-run the film the film festival. And it is. It, it's you, you, like you said. Yeah. I mean, sometimes you get some duds. But overall, <laughs> the quality of filmmaking going on in the UFO uh, genre, I think, has never looked brighter. I mean, like you said. We live in an age now where anyone can be a filmmaker. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm not saying that, like, don't don't go to film school or anything, but you can shoot one of these amazing movies right on your phone nowadays. So yeah. The fact that we're getting such good quality stuff um, that's also informational and insightful rather than just entertainment, uh, that's important. So I, I can't wait to... Um, to see some of those as they move forward. And uh, for those of us who can't make it to the Congress, I know that there are DVDs available of every talk. Is that correct? Are you guys still doing that? Yes, we do DVDs. So if you go to ufocongress.com, there's a store where you can purchase the DVDs. Um, Probably in the next week, we'll put some pre-orders up for box sets. However, if you go to the front page, you'll also find a link to our on-demand video portal. And uh, we have a two-week free trial where you can watch all of our – we've got lectures going back to 2011 on this. So we already have hundreds of lectures on this video portal. And really, this is what I recommend over DVDs. First of all, they're cheaper than DVDs. And if you're like me, I haven't touched except for the the ones we make. I haven't actually put a DVD into a (laughs) DVD player and played it for. Ever. I did Project Blue Book. Actually, they sent me the DVDs. I, you too, I think. Yep, so right. those were the last ones I played. Before that, it had been years. I don't watch DVDs, but I watch stuff online. So uh, this way you have it with you wherever you go online. And the subscription is really cheap after that two weeks for a monthly basis. I think it's five ninety nine, and then um, And then you have access to all of these. So we'll be posting the 2019 videos up on our portal as quickly as possible. And uh, we'll get those up real soon so everybody can enjoy those and see those. But that, to me, is the best. It's the most cost-effective. And the best way to watch them is to to join the video portal. Uh, So I don't know if I should say that because, you know, you'll you'll save money if you do that. But uh, (laughs) uh, the video portal is awesome. It's it's really cool. And uh, I think the people who take advantage of it love it. But, uh, yeah, you'll see that on the front page. That's just the easiest way to do it. You don't have to take anything home or, or come. You can watch it on the portal when they when they show up. And it's kind of fun because then every week or, you know, there's a new video for you to watch. So. I recommend the portal, but uh, yes, we will have DVDs as well. Awesome. Yeah, and you know, the speakers sign them too there, so that's always a plus too. That's another, yeah, you can get the speakers to sign them, and, and people love doing that. Yep, yep, yeah. I'm I lo- I'm sort of still old school. I love my DVDs, my, my hardcover <laughs> yeah. books, but, but you know, it is much more convenient when you can just couple clicks and stream it. So, no, I think it's amazing. Like, And how the, did that go for you when you moved from one coast to the other. Oh my gosh, man. I think my entire <laughs> U-Haul was just crates of books and uh, <laughs> DVDs. So I'm learning to slowly move away from that. Yeah. <laughs> but, and they yeah. get so heavy. I know. It just gets heavier and heavier. But, you know, I'm trying to amass that great UFO library, just like, <laughs> um, you know, some of our mutual colleagues who have rooms yeah. and rooms full of them. So that's my goal. But right now, most of them are in storage, uh, safe yeah. storage, because, uh, you know, these New York apartments, <laughs> right? Not much room for anything else other than like a uh, little couch. And, and that's about it. <laughs> right. 
<laughs> but I love it. Um, well, I mean, for someone like me who unfortunately cannot make it this year, I love that I'll be able to still see and hear a lot of the speakers. Um, I do have an on-site correspondent who's going to be doing some interviews out there. So I know we'll have some live stuff coming to Somewhere in the Skies from the Congress. So that'll oh. be really fun. But um, can you once again, Alejandro, let us know where we can get tickets, more information on speakers, and everything. Let's go through the rundown. Okay. So ufocongress.com is where you're going to find everything. Now, uh, tickets are no longer, as of last night, you can't buy them online anymore. We always have to, you know, you got to stop because you have to print up the tickets and everything. So we had to process those and print those. And poor Karen was up literally all night, you know, uh, getting those badges ready for everybody. Uh, so we can get that to the printer. So really, we waited the last minute before we uh, tur- turned off the online registration. However, you can still see ticket prices and you can still buy tickets at the door. So no worries. The only thing we have sold out thus far is Ben Hans's Skywatch. Unfortunately, that is sold out. So you won't be able to do that. That sold out really quickly. Everybody oh, wow. really wants yeah, to, I forgot to mention that one. Yeah. Go up and see. Go with Ben Hansen. Um, Ben Hansen, by the way, will also be speaking on Sunday. He's got this most incredible uh, UFO or I mean ghost video right. on his new TV shows. But he's going to be talking about kind of how the, you use similar tech in ghost hunting and UFO hunting. But um, otherwise, some of the lunch events are almost sold out. But uh, when you get to the conference, you'll be able to purchase them. So everything uh, will be available when you get to the conference. You can buy their tickets there. So no worries. Still come by. We have room and we have space for everything. So if you still want to come and you haven't bought your ticket yet, still come out. Uh, We'll just get you your tickets uh, when you get there. So UFOcongress.com, you'll be able to find all of that. Awesome. I love it, man. Again, I wish I could be there, but I know it's going to be an amazing event and next year for sure. But uh, awesome because we miss you uh, a lot. I know. I miss you guys, too. Again, this is where I got my start. So, yeah, no, I it's it's just such a big community of people building each other up instead of tearing each other down. So if anyone is in the area or not in the area, you heard it. Tickets are still available. Please go to the UFO Congress. I can't recommend it enough. And I have to congratulate you and Karen for for pulling this off, man. I I know it can't be easy, but I know how much blood, sweat, and tears you two have put into this. So um, in early, congratulations, and I have no (laughs) doubt it's going to be amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alejandro. And thank you for joining me on Somewhere in the Skies. Yes, my pleasure. Always fun. In the Skies is produced by Third Kind Productions in association with the Entertainment One Podcast Network. To learn more, visit entertainmentonepodcast.com. In reality, UFOs are seen by people from all walks of life, every day, all around the world. They've also been officially investigated by the U.S. government and by governments of several other countries, too. That's just a small element of what makes the strange UFO topic so incredibly fascinating and fun to explore. That's what we do on the UFO podcast, Unknown. I'm Jason McClellan, and I invite you to explore the weird and wonderful world of UFOs with me and my friends and colleagues on Unknown. Unknown is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and all the usual podcast places.